Hey, it's my pleasure to introduce Ken first. Thank you, Thank you Jeff. Um, so I'm Ken first. My lovely assistant and business partner, Jason Schijano, will be manning the Vanna White role of clicking on my slides. Get up yes, we, we, he's been practicing all week for this. So. Um, as much as Jeff has said, all of you know who we are. There are a lot of new faces here tonight. So just for a quick minute, I just want to explain. Levitt First is one of the largest independent insurance brokers in Westchester and our niche is the real estate and construction industries. And the reason why our 50 person office is the are the advisors to the Builders Institute, the Condo Co-op Council, and all the associations here tonight is because we've created programs unique to these industries where we group you together and get you group discounts on insurance. So those of you that have not, don't know about our services, feel free to call. Plus we offer some unique value-added services that no other insurance broker uh, can provide to help people that manage properties, that own buildings, that are, run construction companies, and so forth. Because we're a niche player, we're able to create and develop unique products and services for these two industries. So feel free to talk to Jason or myself after tonight's presentation. I also want to take a minute to introduce two other people in the audience. One from our office is Pat Clare, who's the director of our real estate division. Pat, can you raise your arm? And also, I'd like to take a minute, we're, you know, I'm going to build up to a new insurance certificate that's out there called the Accord 855. And we're lucky enough to, uh, tonight to have with us Anthony Carlucci from Greenblatt, well, Wellby Greenblatt, and Brady. Uh, that, what is it? Yeah, Wellby, Brady, Greenblatt. I've known them for 20 years, but I get it all mixed up. Where are you, Anthony? Right here. So Anthony was one of the creators of this certificate. I'm part of a committee that's worked for multiple years on this. The end product, you know, there are those jokes when you get too many people in the room and what the end product looks like. It's not a perfect end result, but we're going to talk about it when, you know, towards the end of the presentation and talk about how you might or might not want to be using this. Insurance certificate. Jason and I have been in front of you many, many times, and we've told you what the value of this insurance certificate is. You do not have a sample in front of you. you have, we're not going to talk about the handouts that are in front of you towards, until the end, so you don't have to look at them. This is just a regular certificate. We've told you over and over again, it means nothing. You can't rely on this piece of paper. All this piece of paper tells you is that the contractor that you hired has an insurance policy with certain limits that supposedly end on a certain date. That's it. We've been in front of you multiple, multiple times explaining this. And we've told you that the second part of the equation is that you need to have a contract to go with the certificate. And once those two pieces come together, then you are protected. One without the other serves you no good. So I'm going to review that again today and get, get you to that point of why you need those parts to come together to fit the puzzle. But then we're going to take it to the next stage, which has evolved over the last couple of years, which is what has created the invention of this new certificate, which you might have a contract, you might have the insurance certificate, but you don't know what type of insurance that contractor is telling you he has. You have no idea whether or not that policy is a real policy, a fake policy, a policy that excludes him going on the roof, that excludes him working on your, on your house, excludes working on your building, excludes you because you're in the Bronx. You have no idea. It just shows that they have insurance. So now a new certificate has been created called the 855 that is supplemental. It's an additional form that you might or might want your contractors to start to fill out. Truthfully, I don't think anyone here in this room will end up using that certificate. But we're going to, towards the end of this, I am going to show you a spectrum of ways from doing almost nothing to having this certificate. And then there are ways that you can ratchet it back and try to figure out what's useful for your operation. If you're a general contractor, you're going to want to be pretty close to this because you're hiring contractors day in and day out, and this is going to dramatically impact your insurance rates for the long term. 
If you're a property manager, you might just want to you know, pull out a couple factors from this and just be focused on checking on your roofers or your painters or the guys on the exterior of the building. And you might adapt some, some iteration of this to what you feel you need to protect. At the end of the day, your insurance, if you're dealing with a professional insurance broker and has gotten you um, insurance policy, your policies are going to protect you. What, what you're not protected from is that if a claim hits and you've hired a sub or a contractor with bad insurance, it's going to drive up your insurance rates because the insurance, this claim that your painter that fell off the scaffold or the ladder is now going to impact you for five years. So you, at the end of this presentation, will have to determine how important that is to you, you know, how important it is to control your rates. Can you control your board? You, know, you, you might not be able to control the board of your building the board, and they just want to hire the cheapest contractor each time. So be it. But at least by the end of tonight, you'll know what's at risk. Jason. So we start at the beginning. I'm going to go backwards just to remind you of how we got here. And it all starts with workers' compensation. The whole concept behind workers' comp is that if a guy gets injured, he gets paid. His medical bills get paid. Most of his lost compensation gets paid. End of story. But 100 years ago, before workers' comp, what would happen is the guy would fall in a factory, and he would have to sue the owner of the factory to collect because he broke his leg. And then the owner, the mean own, owner of the factory, would sue him and say, "No, you were negligent. You shouldn't have been on that wet floor or something." And so you'd have them suing each other. Lawyers would be involved. It would turn into a big, expensive ordeal that would drag out for a long time. So 100 years ago, they created workers' compensation. They said, "No lawyers, no attorneys, no lawsuits. The guy gets paid. No questions asked." We might not all agree when, a, when an employee gets injured, you might want to sue, you might want to get, fight it. The courts lean towards these poor in, you know, injured employees, but trust me, we're all saving a lot of money by taking the attorneys out of the system and just ha having an injured employee collect for his medical bills and move on, get lost page, wages, and then hopefully come back to work. Except in New York. <laughs> There used to be a small loophole that has now grown into a huge loophole in New York. And you've heard the terms labor law 240, 241, scaffold law, safe place to work law. All these things are connected. They're all different names for a law that's been on the books for many, many years. But lawyers have now figured a way to exploit that to be able to sue when someone gets injured. The footnote is this does not apply to construction on single family or two family homes. There are some ways to penetrate it, but for the most part, these what we're going to talk about does not involve if you're just you know dealing on single or two family homes. It does impact you know co-ops, condos, apartment buildings, and so forth, but single family homes no. So in New York, there's this law that says the building owner or the general contractor, whoever's hiring this contractor, is required to provide a safe place to work when something involve, it involves heights. Now the term heights, when this law was first created, was the, the whole thing was about people falling off scaffolds off the side of the building, and it was, it was those evil building owners that were not providing a safe place for these contractors to work, and so that's where this, this whole came from. But as this has been exploited over the years, heights now means your electrician that gets up on the chair to change a light bulb, if he falls off, that's a height-related injury. The painter that's on the ladder inside the apartment and falls off, that's a height-related injury. The excavator that falls into the ditch is a height-related injury. It's been pushed to such an extreme that you could have a contractor who's sitting, standing on the floor and a hammer falls off someone's ladder, lands on his foot, height-related. He has a broken foot, that's a height-related claim. But what's the worst part about this law is that when it was created to pr protect these contractors working on the outside of these buildings, they said it's 100% the responsibility of the, business, of the building owner. It's absolute liability on that general contractor that hires the, com hires the sub to work for him. There's no defense, okay? So you can hire a painter who goes out and has a six-pack at lunch, 
comes back, grabs the broken ladder that's sitting in the dumpster that says, do not use, gets on that, drunk, falls off, you're responsible. So this has been a field day for attorneys, trial attorneys in New York. And it is, you know, slowly, slowly has snowballed over the last 10 years as more and more people have figured out this great way to collect when you get injured at work. I'll tell you one example. We have one uh, contractor, all of a sudden a lawsuit showed up on his desk for one of uh, the guys that works for him that doesn't speak English, um, suing him through this whole thing. And he turns to him and says, why are you suing me? And the guy said, I'm not suing you. I don't even know what this is about. Turns out you have ambulance chasers now that go through the hospitals. And he remembers signing a form because someone came to his room and said, oh, you got injured on the job. This is for workers' compensation. And he signed a form that basically retained an attorney for him. So his boss said, you can't sue. You've got to stop this because we, you know, we're going to go out of business. And, and so this injured employee you know, called up his attorney and said, I, you know, I never wanted to sue. Please cancel this. And the attorney said, are you kidding? I'm going to get you a quarter of a million dollars for nothing. The lawsuit proceeded. Okay. The system has gotten out of control. So how does this work? So in New York, guy breaks his leg, uh, falls off a ladder, breaks his leg in New York. He's painting. He collects workers' comp the normal way, like every, every other state in the country. But now he sues the building owner. He sues the GC, okay? He can't sue his boss, this poor guy that got injured, because there's workers' comp law. So the only way that he's able to collect is to sue the building owner or the GC. So we've been telling you for the last five years that the way to protect yourself is to push this risk back down to the employer. You control the subs. You control the contractors that come onto your property. So you, it's your job to demand that, the sub, that this contract that comes on your property is going, to hold, is going to take responsibility for this injury, and you're not going to been, get hit with the claim. So we've been teaching you for years how to transfer this risk. We've told you, as I said before, you get a certificate, and then you have a contract. Contract could be one paragraph long, or it could be five pages long, but it has to contain two key ingredients. One, that you require this contractor that you hire to list you as additionally insured on his policy. And two, that he's going to hold you harmless. He's going to indemnify you. So if, and if he screws up, if his guy gets injured, if he causes a problem on the job, he's saying his insurance is going to take care of this. And you need these, both these things in a contract that he signs before he starts working, not after the accident, before he goes on the job site. And again, one more time, having a certificate that shows that you're additionally insured means nothing if you don't have this other part. You need both parts of the puzzle to protect yourself. One without the other, you got nothing. So, what has happened? The lawsuits, as I said, in New York are now in the six and seven figure level. Okay, you don't have to be a paraplegic. You just, you know, you break your arm, you, you fall off, you soft tissue injury. It's in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this has led that all the contractors' insurance rates have now skyrocketed. Guys that are working out on roofs, on the exteriors of the building, have, rates have gone up four, five, six times. And anyone that's higher than that, you've heard this story over the last couple of years. Guys that aren't on heights have also seen their rates go up two to three times, all a result of this. So then what happens? There's always a game. And the smaller contractors have figured out a way to get around this, and they buy cheap insurance. They've figured out they can't afford all these rate increases because the GCs say, oh, I'm not going to pay for this, and the property managers say, I'm not going to pay for this. And so you got the smaller guys out there that are getting what's called cheap insurance. So what does that mean? Here you are. You get sued. You try to transfer the risk down, and then you're blocked. 
Okay, you can't push the insurance and the fault and this claim down onto the sub any longer because he bought cheap insurance. What do I mean by that? They buy policies that exclude claims. It says, we'll, you know, we'll cover certain things, but we're not going to cover you if one of your guys gets injured on the job, meaning they don't want to be brought into a labor law claim. It could exclude if, they hi if your sub hires a sub and that sub gets injured. There could be an exclusion on the policy for that. There could be exclusion on, there are exclusions on policies now that say, we're going to cover you except if you go up on heights, except if you go over two stories, except if you go on the exterior of the building. They don't want to cover you for that. And that's how they get cheap insurance. There's policies out there that are excluding any claims that involve working on a new building, working in the five boroughs, working on a residential building. Contractors are finding whatever way there is to save money on insurance, and they're getting policy that have, ex have these exclusions. Or, as blatantly as it says, it says, we're not going to cover any contracts you sign. So if you've signed a whole harmless to the GC, if you've signed a whole harmless to the, to the property manager, we're not covering you. Again, all of you that have good insurance, you're protected. Okay, you're just going to be unsuccessful in pushing the claim down. You might get hit some policies for general contractors you might say, hey, listen, if you hire a contractor with cheap insurance, you're going to have to pick up the first $25,000 or $50,000 of the claim, but you're still going to be protected. But it will impact you in the long run. Here's a partial list of cheap insurance companies. We give this to all our contractors when they're you know, looking to hire subs. And anyone that needs a copy of it, feel free to email Jason or I, and we can get you with it. It's not, I did not hand this out today. But this is a partial list of bad insurance companies. And some of them you'll recognize. Utica First, you'll see a lot of carpenters with. You'll see Essex. You'll see Century Surety. You'll see Atlantic Casualty. Those are common cheap insurance companies in in this area. And you're going to have to start deciding whether or not, when you're looking at two bids, whether or not they have the right type of insurance. You're going to decide how much time and effort you want to invest to protect your insurance company from getting hit with these claims. You're not going to get hit with it. Your insurance company is going to get hit with it. And when your insurance company gets hit with it, it shows up on your claims history. And you know when we shop around your insurance, we have to show five years of history. And that claim will show for five years. And if you're a general contractor and you have one of these claims that shows that you hired a cheap sub, I'll tell you what the insurance companies think. They think this guy runs a shoddy job. They think this guy is just hiring the cheapest uh, subs. They're not looking at the paperwork. And we can't, as much as Jason and I want to shake it and say, no, it's just a random thing. Look, here are all the great certificates that he gets and all the contracts and he reviews this. And we have no credibility because now the insurance companies had to pay out a $500,000 claim and your insurance rates will have gone up for many years to come. So what I'm going to do now is talk to you about the spectrum of protection that you could do. And you're going to, at the end of tonight, you're going to have to decide what's good, you know, what's reasonable for your operation. So at the lowest level is what people used to do. You just collected a certificate of insurance, a worker's comp and a liability certificate. Boom, end of day. Obviously, hopefully no one in this room is doing that. Many of you now have ratcheted up and you're getting a subcontractor agreement from every contractor before they start work. And that's terrific. But you can ratchet it up one more level. First of all, to make sure that they have workers' comp, if, they're, if you're working in New York, you could go online to see if their workers' comp policy is active. That it, you know, it's not a small guy that let it lapse. You can't rely on the insurance company sending you a cancellation notice. But there's a database on workers' comp, and you can email us, and we'll tell you what that is. And you could, before you pay them, before you hire them, the smaller guys that you're a little questionable about, you could check once a month, whatever. You, again, it's up to you. And then on the liability side, you could, you know, go down that checklist that we just showed you of 30 different insurance companies, 
Okay, and make sure that you're, you just, and this is what many of our contractors have been doing for years, and they just check to see is that contract or that sub with any one of these insurance companies, and then they don't hire them. Many of our contractors send us the certificates of the subs that they hire, and they let us review it. And that's another way of you, that you can protect, protect yourself. But you can ratchet it up and one more. Now, you can ask for documentation to find out whether or not the insurance they have is cheap insurance or not. Because we've just, we've, we, we now just got hit with a general contractor in Westchester that diligently would go down that list of 30 companies and he made sure he never hired one of those. Well, it turns out he just hired a sub this past fall from Western New York who had a company we never heard of, so it wasn't on the checklist. He never sent us the insurance certificate. Of course, that's the sub that had an injury. It turns out, of course, that small company, uh, insurance company that none of us had heard of a, that didn't make our list was cheap insurance, so he's getting hit with it. So that's one of the reasons why things have ratcheted up, where now people, more sophisticated general contractors in the city, even uh, GCs out here are starting to say, we're going to add one more piece of documentation that we're going to require our contractors to provide us before they start work. And this document has to be signed by that contractor's insurance broker. So, what we're going to go over next is this document that's now called, you know, the Certificate 855. And you do not have to look at the one that's, because I'm going to have it up here. And we're going to go through that. And I'm just going to go through it briefly, and I'm going to, and I, oh, one more box, thanks Jason. There's even another extreme that some of the biggest GCs do, that I don't think anyone here, but they're, 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 the GCs in the city have whole teams of people that are now analyzing this, and they require a copy of the policy of every contractor that comes on their job. Just wanted to show you the whole spectrum and extremes that you could go to protect yourselves from hiring subs that might have bad insurance. So, in a second I'm going to go over the Certificate 855. There are four handouts in front of you. Don't bother looking at them now. One is the 855. One is an 11-page document that came out at the same time as the 855 to help you understand the 13 questions on the 855. We then gave you a copy, a highlighted version of the 855 with what we say, if you're going to use that, these are the answers that you're going to want to look for on that policy. And then the fourth document is a letter that we created that if you're a client of ours and you want us to send you a Word document of it, that you could just use it. It's a simplified letter that you send out to your subs and have it there, their insurance broker sign that asks some of the similar questions and focuses on where we see the biggest exposures. So I'm going to briefly now go through the 855. There are 13 questions. The first one just asks if the insurance company that you're dealing with is it admitted or not admitted. I'm not going to explain this to you. I'm not going to go through definitions and waste your time on it. Because you're not going to, it's not a really a relevant factor for you. Unless you're a large general contractor, and then we're more than happy to spend as much time as you want explaining it. You could be asking whether or not, what type of, do they, are they using the standard insurance ISO forms, or do they have own concocted, custom-made forms? But number C is an important question. This, you might come out of this meeting and say, you know what, I'm going to send to my, all the contractors uh, that I hire this form and just tell them to answer questions C, D, F, and L, or whatever. And that's all you want, you want them to do. Figure out what's relevant to you. So C is the question that requires his insurance broker to say, are there any major exclusions on this policy? Does it exclude where he works? And he can't go in the five boroughs. He can't go into Connect, you know, Connecticut, or maybe type of construction. He can't go on new buildings. He can't go on residential buildings. Is there a restriction on there about how high he, he's allowed to work? Is there a classification limitation? There are policies out there. You hire a painter, and his policy might say he's covered for painting and nothing else. And then all of a sudden you have your painter. Oh, listen, while you're here, can you just build, finish out that shed out there and get up and do he might not have any coverage for that. 
Maybe there's a designated work that he's only allowed to do certain things or he's not allowed to do certain things. So this, que this one question on there could fill in a lot of the aspects of it that you might be concerned about. There are different forms of additional insured out there. If you're a sophisticated GC and you want to know which ones really to dig into and ask for, we're happy to spend time with that. But as long as one of your, your subs have additional insured, like an additional insured, you'll be fine. Okay, then, and then the wording starts to get, well, the first question is, you know, how is his policy written? Will his policy pick up primary, meaning his policy will pay first and then yours? That's the way you want it, but most of the people in this room are not going to try to fight for that. Many of the policies already have that in there, but I don't think it's a high priority for, for the average contractor or building owner. You know, will you get advance notice, you know, if the policy's canceled? Everyone's going to say yes, but you can't count on that. You're going to want to know that they have the normal blanket contractual liability, and you're going to want to know that there were no changes on G, H, and I on their policy. Unfortunately, when you had, I don't know how many people were on the committee that made this, but the, the phrasing on this is like a triple negative. And so we get calls constantly from people that are trying to fill this out on what does this exactly mean. But basically, you want to know that they have additional insured and nothing was changed, that the contract, you know, the original policies used to say if you sign a contract, you're covered. We want to make sure that hasn't been changed. There are policies, cheap insurance, that says you can't sign a contract. And this is the one that says, is there an exclusion? Have you now added an exclusion there about someone getting injured on the job site? So G, H, and I are important questions that you would want answered. Jason. And then, you know, if your job involves any um, site work, if it, if foundations and so forth, you want to make sure the excavator or the people working there don't have an exclusion for that type of work. You want to, you know, there's a uh, crazy exclusion out there for insured versus insureds. You don't want that exclusion on there. It's important, as weird as it sounds. It's some, the way the phrasing could be, it might exclude them listing you as additional insured. As stupid as it sounds, because they'll say, oh no, that name has been put on your policy, so we're not going to protect that name. So you don't want K, you want to make sure no changes were made. And then here, this is L, K and L are important because L says similar stuff for the subs of the sub to make sure they don't, you know, that the sub that you hired doesn't have exclusions on his policy that excludes him hiring subs. Or that if something happens to the subs that he hires, there's no protection from him pushing it down. And then you don't, you don't have to worry about M. So, so, this is Jason on Tuesday, let's say Thursday, Tuesday, up in Albany, fighting this law. Hundreds and hundreds of people in the insurance field, in the construction field, every association was represented there. We've been fighting for years to try to fight the scaffold law. What, he, what Jason's holding in his hands is a diagram, because Illinois used to have a similar law. When they got rid of the law, allowing, you know, the law that said it's absolute liability, and it's the fault of the GC and the property owner. And then Illinois said, no, you know what, okay, it should be fair, we'll figure out a proportional amount of risk. Look what happened to the insurance rates. Anyone that's in the construction industry knows how much their insurance rates have gone up in the last couple of years. This is the impact that if we could get something changed in Albany, this would happen. And Jason has another picture. I have to change this Yep. We got your smile. Oh, you're not in the smile here. This was a study done with the Tappan Zee Bridge of how much more it's costing on the New York side versus the New Jersey side, all because of labor law. They're not using different materials on the New Jersey side. They're not using different paint or different barges. But if you get injured on the New York side, you have labor law on your to help you. They have Chris Christie. We had Sheldon Silver. 
So we had hoped once Shelton Silver, he had been known, you know, the big thing that has come out about him is that he was being paid millions and millions of dollars by trial lawyers, you know, uh, partnerships in the city. All the ones you see advertised in the TV were funding him to be his advocate to keep this law in effect. You know, with Albert, you know, we talked about with the, our lobbyist here. Um, unfortunately, we don't know if the person that has stepped into Sheldon Silver shoes will be much different. It can't get worse, but we're hoping it's too soon now to tell what, what's around the corner. So, Jason, are there any things that you want to add to what I said, or should we open up for questions first then? No, I, I think that just, um Right. And, you know, we go through the whole process. It takes years. You know, 
And you should like that I, I don't know if Anthony can add anything to this, but as far as we know, it's not supposed to handle be be picked up on a single one or two family home unless the homeowner has given direction. Yeah, you know, then you bring in the homeowner. But if it's just you building a house, that shouldn't be. But do you have a thought on that? questions and are they protected do they have to worry about hiring contractors and we say no with the labor law unless you're directing a contractor you don't have to worry about it but the point is as a GC if you're working on a single family or two family home you do have that exposure um, uh, so you know what the, probably the clarification is if you're just a roofer work on Mr. and Mrs. Smith's house there's no exposure okay there's no labor law third party if you're a GC working on a single family or a two family home and you hire a sub, now you've given a, you know, that diagram the opportunity to kick in. That's because you now have another layer. by uh, GCs and property owners there that are now starting to screen out more and more and they won't let, you know, on the bigger buildings, let you know, a guy on the roof that doesn't have the right type of roofing coverage. And so it's right, you know, we insure many, many roofers. And five years ago, they would be saying, oh, John down the street was able to get on and he has cheap insurance. Well, now the, the roofers in, in the five boroughs, they can't get on any of those roofs. You know, the building owners in the city won't let anyone there without you know, good quality insurance. So it's getting out there more and more. It's just the reality, you know, as you get smaller and smaller, if you own one little building and you have a board and, and you're looking at two, two, two roofers and one has a $50,000 difference in their price, it's, it's hard to explain that to a bunch of board members. So, if, you know, but if you own the building, you're looking at your own pocketbook and we, we strongly recommend that this becomes part of your bid process. Don't wait for the day that you get the, the, you're get you in front of the board and you're presenting different numbers. This should be part of your specs when you're sending out something out to bid and you say, submit with us this form or whatever form you create with a, with a sample certificate so that you're screening out things before you even get to that one. Alan? smaller subs get scared of signing these documents all along. So you have to explain to them, 
This only is if you're negligent. If you're having the plumber sign this document, he's not taking on the responsibility of the electrician and the roofer and everything else. You have to tell him, Liz, if you want to go on this job, you have to sign this, but it's just due to your negligence that you're taking responsibility for it. Um, sir? Uh, Robert Steiner. Uh, um, hey, Bob. Um, with the 855, how, if I were to write an RFP for doing road work, doing a painting job, something like that, would I put into the RFP requirement that the insurance certificates they provide to us are the 855? And also, let me, two more, who signs them and if they're inaccurate, who bears responsibility? Okay, so this is again, this is supplemental to the normal certificate that you want. So this will be an additional certificate that you will require. And it, it requires that contractor's insurance broker to sign on it. As it gone through the courts, so whether or not um, the insurance broker was, you know, um, made a mistake on it, and then all of a sudden, or lied on it. Yeah, I was and going it, to the mistake because it needs light. Right, but, but you know, it's so new, it hasn't gone, but it's fraud. So then you, you have to go through the, every insurance worker has uh, errors in mission. But the truth is, you know, you get to the, it's mostly the smaller insurance brokers that are giving these crappy insurance policies. They're all based in Brooklyn. And, you know, it's true. And we see all the certificates and the ones, it's these guys in Brooklyn that people get um, the certificate and they'll go out of business by the time you, you sue them. So it's just one more step, but, I, but it's not. You know, are they widely available? No. Are, are you guys looking at this stuff in the RSS or RRS? No, we are not looking at this in the RRS. This is not even being used by most general contractors at this point. This is months. I mean, Anthony, when was this group? Yeah, just in the last few months. And and most insurance brokers don't even know how to fill it out. That's so that's why you know we're here to educate you just about the issue. You you could determine how to implement it. If you know if you're dealing with buildings here in Westchester, most of the smaller subs contractors won't go out and fill it out. But you might take six questions out of it, create your own document and say, we need this notarized by your insurance broker if you want to bid on it. And focus on the things that are concerning to you. Good question. <clears throat> Related to your presentation, do you have this presentation somewhere that can be accessed? I don't know. I should come. Uh, please, sure. <laughs> of course, we can email you this presentation. I'm only interested primarily in the initial couple of slides. Not the pictures of Jason. <laughs> no, I know, that, that's uh, because it wasn't in, the, in one of the handouts. The question is what to do, how to proceed. So your early slides basically hold and explain that. Everyone, most people who know where we live. Just contact us if you want the whole presentation. If you just want a page of it, if you want us to come meet with you, just let us know what you need. We're happy to give it to you. Jason. Any other questions? Good luck sleeping tight tonight. Once again, another great job by Ken Burst and Jason Skishano of Levitt First Associates. Thank you both for an excellent presentation.